Faith is the basis of Christian life. But the problem nowadays is that people don't know what faith is. The church is in trouble. You'd agree with that, wouldn't you? The trouble is that we are not taking our God seriously enough. What's the proof of that? Why that we're not taking his word seriously enough? And we're not making sure that our faith matches the teaching of Scripture. We don't even seem to be interested in finding out. That's not good enough. Maybe you call yourself a Christian, but do you know what Christian truth really is? Could you explain your faith? Do you base it on the Bible? Could you defend it against challenges? Faith is the most momentous reality that I can think of. We need to know what we believe. We need to be able to defend it when it's challenged. And we need to have reason for relying on it as a basis for our lives. Do you know what you believe? And if so, is it based on the Bible and what the Bible says? And what does the Bible say about faith, about life, about Jesus Christ? Could you explain it if you wanted to? Could you defend it if you had to? What is truth? Those are all good questions that we should be asking ourselves because those are the questions that a lot of unbelievers are asking the church. In fact, if you have friends who are not Christians, you've probably been asked some version of one or more of those questions already. And if you haven't, you probably will. And those are the people, by the way, that we owe it to, to get it right. Not to have all the answers because no one this side of heaven has all the answers, but but we should be able to answer those questions that count the most, those eternal questions. Those are the ones that people who honestly want to know the truth are asking, okay? There, and there's no shortage of people all around us every day who are actively seeking answers about faith and life and relationships and eternity, people who legitimately want to know what is truth. And we... As his people, we have a, a profound responsibility to be able to offer them the answers that they're looking for. It is also true, however, and I think also very important that we recognize this fact and be able to identify those people, and there are plenty of them, who are not actually interested in the truth. And yet they want to captivate your time and focus all the same, even though they're not the least bit interested in seeking out truth because they're not the least bit interested in having to make any changes to their lives. Because if there is objective truth, and if that truth is different than what they currently believe, then they will have to change some things about their lives, right? We all do. I've met plenty of folks who have no interest in that, regardless of what is at stake. They've no interest in asking sincere questions. They've no interest in listening to other viewpoints. They've no interest in learning anything that might challenge their own positions. Yet they love to argue and debate and dominate the conversation when they can hammer other people about the hypocrisy of faith and religion and God and church and life and so on. Why? Because it makes them feel better about their own choices. If a person who is hostile toward the gospel can back you into a corner and feel like they've won an argument, then it makes the fact that they've chosen to reject Jesus Christ feel a lot less convicting, right? Because if people who claim to believe in and follow Jesus Christ can't even defend their own faith, then maybe there's nothing to it. 
It's reassurance that their gamble to snub their nose at God and live life their own way might be okay after all. And we're going to see some examples of that in our story today. But listen, unfortunately, the same description could be said of a lot of Christians today. There are believers who cannot effectively articulate why they believe in Jesus Christ, who cannot tell you why they believe what the Bible says, or, or even tell you what it says at all. And yet some of those same believers can be the, the most contentious, argumentative, to be frank, obnoxious, beat down other people in a second kind of religious folks. And you can tell who they are because they're never interested in listening to anyone else's viewpoints about faith and religion and God and church and life and so on, okay? But saying that we believe in something and at the same time not truly understanding it or even being willing to take the time to try and understand it is no different than those who say they don't believe and are not interested in learning the truth. Okay, as, as followers of Christ, we are compelled to know what we believe and to be able to defend that faith. And, and listen, we've nothing to fear in engaging in those two-way conversations where we not only share our faith, but we actually listen to those viewpoints of others that are different than ours. We've nothing to fear in doing that as long as we know what we believe and can defend that belief according to the teachings of Christ in Scripture because the Christian faith is defendable. It can be intelligently explained and articulated and defended against other arguments, but that requires two elements. It requires two people, to be specific, who both understand what they believe and who, uh, who are willing to listen and consider thoughtfully to what the other has to say. And I'll tell you that there have been several times in my own life when having those kinds of meaningful conversations about my faith with other people who were questioning it, there have been times when that has caused me to have to re-examine or dig deeper into the scriptures to better understand my own position, my own beliefs. That's a good thing because I was asked questions that made me pause and say, you know, I need to understand that better than I do. I don't have a good answer for you right now. And so I went back and read and studied and prayed and asked others more mature in the faith than me those same hard questions. And in the end, I became a better representative of the gospel because I learned some greater measure of faith, of truth. I gained a deeper understanding of my beliefs. And I'm still growing in those areas, and I hope that I always am. So don't be afraid of those conversations with people who don't believe what we believe. Let them challenge you. Let them stretch you. You'll come out better for it and better prepared for the next conversation. But listen, not so that you can win arguments, so that you can win hearts. Okay, when Paul was in Athens, he spent time in these con kinds of uh, conversations in the synagogue, it says in the marketplace, even before the Areopagus, that was this established body that sort of governed and ruled over civil and religious uh, issues in the lives of the Athenians. They would meet either at the Royal Colonnade, uh, which was southwest of the Acropolis, or on the Hill of Ares. Ares was the god of war for the Greeks, and the Hill of Ares, or in English what is known as Mars Hill, was right below the Acropolis. And so all of these great thinkers would gather there regularly to share and debate ideas. And so Paul ends up there with some of these Greek philosophers, which I'll just tell you was not for the weak-minded or anyone who could not effectively you know, communicate their beliefs. And Paul knew what he believed. He wasn't afraid to share it with others who had their own strong beliefs that were different than his. So as we read in Acts 17, verses 17 through 20, tells us that he reasoned, this is Paul, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. But listen to this part. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. What an incredible opportunity for Paul to share the gospel with some of the most influential 
thinkers and leaders of his day because first of all, he had a firm grasp on his own faith and he could defend it. Secondly, they were willing and eager to hear him out. And likewise, Paul was willing to listen to their ideas and to listen to what they believed. Verse 18 says that Paul conversed with these philosophers. 17 says that he reasoned with them. This was clearly two-way, ongoing conversation, and it models the way that we should be engaging people today in our community. And if you keep reading beyond this passage in Acts, Paul goes on to present the gospel to these, to these folks masterfully, even while quoting some of their own pagan writers, right, that these Gentiles were all very familiar with. So he shares the gospel in a way that his audience could relate to and understand, and as a result, it says some of them believed and became followers of Jesus Christ. That's what it looks like when we're willing to listen to others, and, and when it is our time to talk, we know what we believe. We can articulate that faith clearly to people who are actually interested in the truth, and, and again, that's a key element here, because our story today is a great example of people who say they're interested in the truth, but factually Nothing could be further from the truth, as we'll see. And this is where discernment becomes very important. It's when it comes to sharing the gospel, it's a fancy way of saying we need to learn to follow the leading of the Spirit of God when it's time to engage someone in an ongoing conversation about our faith, which often develops as our relationship with that person develops. And yet at the same time, at the same time, we have to know when to walk away from useless confrontations that do more harm than good. And again, Paul certainly understood this. As much as he did take time and effort and energy to pursue dialogue and relationships with people who genuinely wanted to know the truth, Paul also knew when to walk away. We read this passage last week when Paul was trying to testify about the gospel to the religious Jews in Corinth. It says, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Acts 18, 5 and 6, okay? We have to learn when it's time to persevere and when it's time to walk away. And I'll tell you, it's more of an art than a science. It's, it's listening intently to the voice of God when opportunities present themselves. It's asking, Lord, do you want me to engage here, this person, this conversation, or do you want me to walk away? Because there are a lot of people all around us every day who are genuinely searching for the truth. I'm telling you, we owe it to God and we owe it to them to give them our very best every single time. And yet, there will always be those who merely want to tie you up in meaningless arguments for no other reason than to try and best you in the debate in order to make themselves feel better about their own choices. And that, that is a waste of time every time. Okay? We are not required to answer every single question. We're not. There are times when it is actually okay to simply remain silent and allow God to do what He's going to do by His sovereign will without us having to win every argument that is presented to us. One great example is in Matthew chapter 26, verses 59 through 63. Jesus is being questioned by the religious leaders of His day and falsely accused by those who have no interest in actually knowing the truth. They just want to try and entrap Jesus. They just want to try and win their side of the argument. Notice how He responds. It says, now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. They were not interested in truth. At last, two came forward and said, this man said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. We don't have to answer every single question that everyone asks us. There are times when we simply allow the Spirit of God to do what He's going to do without us having to say a word. And yet, 
There are other times when we speak the truth with boldness and clarity, leaving no questions unanswered. There's a balance there. That's a balance that every believer really must learn if we're going to maximize our effectiveness in sharing the truth. And it is just that which Jesus demonstrates so powerfully in our story today as we continue working our way through the gospel according to John. We're going to pick up the story right where we left off last week at chapter 18. This is after Jesus has been questioned by the high priest Caiaphas and his father-in-law Annas, and he's now being transferred to the Roman governor Pilate. So let's read it together, beginning with verse 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning, and they themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So just a note here before we continue about this first verse, this part of the story, because the irony here sets the tone for the rest of the trial narrative, which is rife with irony. In this one verse, John exposes the ridiculous hypocrisy of the Jewish priests who were more than willing to murder an innocent Jesus, the son of the living God, while at the same time being dreadfully afraid of becoming ceremonially unclean. Okay, Jews could go inside a Gentile courtyard as long as it was open to the sky, but if it had a roof on it and they entered it, they would become ceremonially unclean, which means they could not eat the Passover. And so they would not enter the Roman governor's headquarters out of fear of violating their ceremonial law. As they're illegally arresting Jesus on false charges without witnesses, interrogated by a former high priest in the middle of the night before sending him to the actual high priest, before dragging him to the Roman governor, all the while being beaten and spit upon, even though no one could find any evidence to suggest that he was guilty of anything whatsoever. But they were very careful not to go into a Roman building with a roof on it. Are you kidding me? The extent of their hypocrisy is staggering. It is the very height of false virtue, but that's just what religious people have been doing throughout the ages. God help us if we become known more for our religious traditions than we do for testifying to the truth. Okay, if getting people to behave differently, listen, to talk differently, to act differently, to vote differently, to attend our religious services, to sign the membership role of our churches, if any of that becomes more important to us than actually sharing the gospel with them, then we are just as guilty of false virtue as the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus Christ is the very embodiment of the truth and sharing that truth, the gospel of Christ with people who do not know him, that is our highest calling. It is our commission from Jesus himself not to make people more like us. It is to make people more like him by making disciples of Jesus Christ. In fact, it was his calling before it was our calling, as we'll see soon enough. Let's keep reading verses 29 through 32. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate asks the Jewish leaders what the charge was against Jesus, and they give what is possibly the most absurd answer of all time. They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. In other words, we don't really have a legitimate charge to bring, Pilate, but you should just accept that he's guilty simply because we say so. And under different circumstances, this response would have probably been laughed off by Pilate and Jesus would have probably been released, except for the fact that the Jewish leaders had a significant amount of leverage against Pilate, which we'll discuss in a few moments. But their response here also points out the fact that the religious leaders were not interested in the truth. 
Okay, Jesus' true identity, the truth of his message, the freedom from the bondage of the law that his truth could bring them, none of that mattered as far as they were concerned because he was messing with their religion. Still, they needed Pilate to order the execution, which is why they didn't simply have Jesus killed themselves because when Rome came in and took over Judea, they began what they called direct rule through a prefect, a Roman governor. It was the year A.D. 6 when that happened. And, and it was at that point that jurisdiction for capital punishment was taken away from the Jews and given to the Roman governor, the prefect. And so the process was that the Jewish religious leaders had to secure a guilty verdict by their own authorities first, which they had done by way of Caiaphas, as recorded in chapter 27 of Matthew's account of these events. But in order to then have Jesus executed, they still needed Pilate, the Roman governor, to pass that sentence, which is why the Jews said it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death in verse 31. And so when verse 32 says this was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken, to show by what kind of death he was going to die, that's a reference to the fact that Jesus predicted the method of his own execution in John 12, 32. He was to be executed by the Romans, which means he would be crucified because that was the Romans' preferred method of execution instead of being stoned to death, which is how the Jews historically executed people. And so by his, ex his crucifixion being lifted up on a cross, Jesus would fulfill the prophecy originally in Isaiah 52, 13, that he would be lifted up which Jesus himself again spoke in John 12, 32. It's a euphemism for crucifixion. It's, it's another way of referencing death by crucifixion on a cross. And so the question by Pilate, although required by law for there to be a formal charge so that he could sentence Jesus to death, was nothing more than an irritating formality for the Jewish leaders because they were not interested in getting to the truth about Jesus. They just wanted to get rid of Jesus because he was a threat to their religion, which was their source of power and pride. This is the same phenomenon that has been happening as long as there's been religion and religious leaders. Truth that doesn't only apply to pastors, by the way, although we can certainly be included in this conversation, but anyone who leads a ministry, a ministry team, a church program, an outreach ministry, it's natural when we lead a ministry in the church to put a lot of focus and a lot of time and a lot of energy on that ministry, as we should. But what happens sometimes is that ministry, that program, the team, the group that we lead, the class that we teach can become more important to us than the reason that ministry was formed to begin with. Okay, we've been given a commission by Jesus to testify to the truth of the gospel and thereby make disciples. And so there are lots of different ways to approach that. So we have a lot of different ministries or programs. We have groups and classes in the church to address the many different approaches to sharing that truth and making disciples, which is all wonderful. But if we're not careful the mechanism that we're using to share that gospel and to make those disciples, the vehicle by which that message is shared, whether it's a class or a small group ministry or a program or an outreach ministry or whatever, that, that religious activity can become more important to us than spreading the truth itself. Because what happens is people become so invested in their particular ministry that they begin to find their identity in it. They begin to find affirmation and validation by others in that ministry, and they begin to feel a sense of honor and respect as they're given authority over those ministries. And all that's well and good. But listen, if we're not really careful, if we're not vigilant about keeping our focus on the gospel message, the truth about Jesus Christ, we can allow those ministries, if we're not careful, those religious activities to become more important to us than the reason those ministries were formed in the first place, which was for the primary purpose of advancing the gospel. And before you know it, we're making decisions based on what's best for that ministry instead of what's best for advancing the truth. And I'll just tell you, unfortunately, my wife and I have seen all too many times in churches when people became more invested in religious activities than they were in the truth, that as soon as change to those ministries was suggested, the claws come out. People, people change. 
We've seen people divided, not over the gospel, but over their program in a church or over their class or over their group. I've seen believers allow religious activities to divide, listen, to divide their marriages, their friendships, even their churches. It's crazy, but it's true because we get more focused on the religious ministry than we are on the reason for that ministry. This is why in just our brief history as a new church, we've already had several ministries come and gone, okay? Some of them, some ministries endure for many years, some for many decades, while others come and go. Not because they aren't good or effective, but because some ministry programs are needed for a period of time, for a season of time, and then it's time to do something else. Why? Because the surrounding culture, the size of the church, the demographic of our community, the resources that are available to us, and the makeup of the congregation, lots of other factors, they're all in a constant state of flux, a constant state of change. Things change all the time, and we, we want to be as effective as possible at all times in testifying to the truth in everything that we do. And so some ministries are effective at a high level for a long time, while others meet a very specific need for a, a very specific season of life. And then it's time for a whole new approach to address a whole new set of circumstances. The point is, we have to stay focused on the reason our ministries exist more than the ministries themselves, or we'll miss all that God wants to do in us and through us as long as we're staying in the center of his will for this church and for these ministries, okay? Jesus showed up on the scene. Things were changing. He was there to do a new thing. But the religious leaders weren't interested. Why? Because they'd become so invested in their religion, in their program, in their group. They became so invested in their religious activity more than they were in the reason that that religious activity was created to begin with. Let's keep reading, verses 33 through 38. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. And then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? And after he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. This is a fascinating interaction between Jesus and Pilate that we can learn a lot from, but among other things, it shows us that the government officials were not interested in the truth. Pilate was certainly asking Jesus some questions here, but his true motivation for doing so is revealed both in the historical accounts of his dealings with the Jews and the way that he frames this final question to Jesus in this passage. So, First, just a quick little history about Pilate and the Jews. We have quite a bit of it from uh, some of the first century theologians, Philo of Alexandria, uh, the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus from the same time period. They tell us that Pilate was appointed as prefect or governor in Judea in A.D. 26 by the emperor Tiberius. He served in that capacity until A.D. 37, but the Judean, uh, Judean outpost was like the least desirable place for a Roman official to be stationed because the Jews were notorious for their resistance to Roman rule. So no Roman government officials wanted to be stuck in Judea, and Pilate was no exception. He hated it there because he hated the Jewish people, and so from very early on, he did whatever he could do to let them know it. So when he first comes to Jerusalem, he brings the Roman standards with him. This has the image of uh, the emperor into the city. It was sacrilegious for the Jews, infuriated them because he's setting up an image of the Roman emperor in their holy city. It was an outrageous offense for the Jews. And so in protest, the Jewish people come to the city en masse. They surround Pilate's house 
and have a sit-down strike. They wouldn't leave for five days, refused to get up or move. So Pilate calls in his troops and warns the Jews that if they do not leave, the soldiers will come and cut off their heads, and he sends the soldiers out. And so in response, the Jewish people laid back and stretched out their necks. Pilate backed down. He removed the, remote, the Roman standards from the city and had the soldiers leave. On another occasion, he brought the votive shields. There were these gold shields with the, uh, the seal, the stamp of the emperor on them, into the holy place. Again, sacrilegious to the Jews. So once again, the Jews protest. The people gather, and in their pro uh, protest, they sent the four sons of Herod to Tiberius, the emperor. The emperor commanded Pilate to respect the Jews' religious freedom and to remove the shields from the holy place. Pilate zero, Jewish people two. Yet again, Pilate suffers a humiliating defeat against the Jews. At a later date, Pilate takes the sacred treasure from the Jewish temple in order to build an aqueduct in the province. Another protest by the Jewish people, but this time Pilate sends soldiers into the crowd and has them club people to death, which ultimately backfires on Pilate as he ends up in even deeper trouble with the emperor. Just one more example. There are many. Roman governors could have coins stamped with any image that they chose for their provinces. So Pilate, knowing exactly what he was doing, had copper coins made that bore the images of pagan religions, which stirred up, you guessed it, right? More protests from the Jewish people and more trouble for Pilate. And so there were all of these occasions where Pilate was frustrated by the Jews in a very publicly humiliating way. And each time they would gather in protest. And he was in danger at this point of losing his job and his position in the Roman government. Tiberius had had it right up to about here with Pilate. Now, why did I tell you all of that? Because it helps to clarify, first of all, why Pilate would ultimately condemn a man that he himself could find no fault in. Because like so many times before, the Jews were beginning to gather in protest, as we'll see, because they wanted Jesus dead. And if Pilate had learned anything during his time in Judea, at this point it was that when the Jews gather in protest, I'd better give them what they want. Otherwise, I'm going to be in big trouble with the emperor. And he knew he was already there. But there was nothing that said Pilate couldn't take a few good jabs at the Jews in the process, which is the reason for his line of questioning. Pilate keeps asking Jesus if he's the king of the Jews. Verse 33 says, are you the king of the Jews? And then verse 37, and Jesus talks about his kingdom, and Pilate says, so you are a king. And then when Jesus is crucified, Pilate has Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, inscribed on a plaque in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek, so as many people as possible could read it. And then he has it attached to the cross that Jesus was crucified on, which we will read in chapter 19 next week. This was Pilate's way of getting back at the Jews because describing Jesus, who they hated, as their king was an infuriating insult, which is exactly what Pilate wanted. So this entire line of questioning by Pilate to Jesus about whether or not Jesus was their king had nothing to do with Pilate actually seeking the truth and everything to do with his desire to humiliate and infuriate the Jewish people, even though he knew all along that he would eventually have to acquiesce to their wishes to see Jesus executed. It's further confirmed in the way that Pilate responds to Jesus' comments about the truth. In verse 38, after Jesus talks about the truth, Pilate, full of cynicism, he says, what is truth? And then he walks out. It says, after he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. So Pilate asks Jesus, what is truth? And he immediately walks away without giving Jesus any chance to answer the question. And in doing so, with great irony, fails to seek an answer from the only person able to give him the answer to his question. One commentary says he dismisses the relevance of truth in the very presence of the one who is truth incarnate. Why? Because Pilate wasn't interested in the truth. He was only interested in preserving his government position and retaining his political power and in the process maybe getting in a good jab against his enemies. And listen, to be honest, I'm not sure 
that government has changed all that much since then. How many candidates for office on both sides of the political spectrum have we seen changing their positions on issues multiple times based on public approval ratings at any given point in their political careers? I'm, I'm certain there are good, God-fearing politicians out there, but how common is it to see men and women in government politics today do just about anything to preserve their positions in government and retain their political power, even if it means sacrificing their own convictions in the process? Which is why we don't rely on our constantly changing government or politics to be our foundation or our security or our provision throughout our lives. No, we rely on the unchanging truth that is Jesus Christ. Right? The next four years in this country could see a lot of significant changes for the better or for the worse. Does that give us reason for concern? Yes, it does. Does that give us reason to pray? It most certainly does. Does that give us reason to panic and fret? No. No, absolutely not. Because our destiny does not lie in election results. The ability to carry out our calling is not determined by our tax-exempt status. And our joy is not dependent upon which political party controls the different branches of government. There is but one arbiter that holds our future. And that is no mere man, or military, or government. It is the one and the only one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is the truth. That's what we carry with us every moment of every day, regardless of what is happening in the world around us. And there are a lot of other people who are looking for that truth, people who are ready to receive it, if someone will simply offer it to them. Let's finish the chapter now, verses 39 and 40, as Pilate once again addresses the Jewish crowds awaiting the fate of Jesus. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? He must have enjoyed that. They cried out again, no, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Well, I'll tell you, Barabbas was much more than a robber. The word robber in this verse is the Greek word leistes. In addition to robber, it means insurrectionist. And if you read about Barabbas in the other Gospels, sure enough, he'd committed many crimes, including robbery, but also insurrection and murder in the course of a rebellion against Rome. Barabbas was a known terrorist. Not the kind of guy you would want to have released, but the crowds were not voting for Barabbas. They were voting against Jesus. The great Irish Presbyterian minister C.S. Robinson said it this way in 1884 when he wrote, It is not true always that men love the evil they seem to clamor for. In many instances, the explanation of their apparent preference is found in simple hatred of the truth which confronts them. You see, Jesus... The personification of truth was offered up for release next to a known terrorist, a murderer, a thief, the embodiment of evil. And the crowds chose Barabbas because the, child, uh, the crowds were not interested in the truth. They weren't interested in Jesus because he didn't look like the king they thought they wanted. You see, they wanted a, a, a man with military might and political prowess, someone who could unite Israel against the Roman occupation and drive them out of their lands. They wanted a soldier on a war horse, not a shepherd on a donkey. They wanted someone who would take the lives of their enemies, not lay his own life down before them. Jesus was truth manifested in the flesh, but they weren't interested in the truth because he didn't meet their expectations. And likewise, listen, there are a lot of people today who will tell you they want the truth, but they want it on their own terms. They don't mind Jesus as long as he doesn't require anything of them, as long as they don't have to make any changes, as long as they don't have to submit their choices or their very lives to him. They're okay with the Bible as long as it doesn't challenge them or correct them or convict them. 
There are a lot of people who say they want the truth, but actually they just want validation and assurance that they can live any way that they want to and never have to face any consequences for any of it. But when they're confronted by the truth, the way, the life, when they're confronted by the gospel of Jesus Christ, they will often shout for any alternative available, which is just what the crowds were doing here with Barabbas because they wanted their own version of the truth. But Jesus didn't say, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to make you feel better about your choices. No, he didn't come to affirm the will of the masses. He said, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Jesus didn't come to give the world his approval. He came to testify to the truth so that the world might be saved. That was his calling in coming to this earth. And it is our calling because we're here to continue the work that he started. Yeah, our foundation for truth is not built on the constantly shifting ground of public opinion. What is popular at any given period of time in our culture has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on determining what is true. What the crowds are calling for is constantly changing. The truth of God's word never changes. And so it's not our job to make people feel better about themselves. In fact, in fact, while the crowds are careening their way through life down the path that leads to destruction, we are supposed to be running headlong into the fray to snatch them out of the fire. We've been called into this world just as Jesus was, not to live in a bubble insulated from the world around us. No, we were sent here to live right in the thick of it. Jude, the brother of Jesus, wrote, Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Jude 22 and 23. You can't snatch people out of the fire unless you go there and grab hold of them. We're not of this world, but we are surely to be in it. Which is why he sent us here, armed with the truth. And so we have this profound responsibility to offer that truth to those who are open to it. Obviously, as we've seen here today, there are plenty of people who are not interested in the truth. But there is no lack of people who are. And those are the ones who need us to know what we believe. They need for us to be able to explain what the Bible says about Jesus and his gospel. There's such a profound responsibility in how we respond to this truth that he's entrusted us with. In John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus prayed to the Father for his followers, for us. His prayer was, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. And in the first chapter of this gospel, John describes Jesus as the word, the logos in the Greek. So Jesus is the truth. And the written word is his story, which means the Bible is the true story about the truth, Jesus Christ. So a holy God sent his holy son on a sacred mission to save the world. And because he knew he could never remember all that he commanded us simply by the retelling of it from generation to generation, he chose to write it down so that any time we wanted to, we could open this book and ingest the truth that it contains. Now don't you think we should at least familiarize ourselves with what it says because it's not simply a matter of becoming better people by the reading of it. No, it's also for those that we encounter who have yet to accept the truth. You see, for them, eternity is hanging in the balance. It's so imperative that we know what we believe and that we take that truth saturated with love and mercy and grace and compassion. We offer it to those who doubt. We snatch them from the fire and make every single moment count because we aren't here to build a nice, comfortable life for ourselves and then die. We're not. We've been sent here to bear witness to the truth, which means we must know 
we must know what is truth. We must be able to explain it when we need to. We, we must be able to defend it when we have to. Because there are people in this world who are asking, what is truth? And we, his people, we've been sent here to give them the answer. Let's pray.